Back when the internet was young and facts still had meaning, there was the History Channel, featuring shows about, you guessed it, history. But that version of the network is long gone today. Here are the biggest scandals to hit the reality TV outlet that's now simply called History. Ice Road Truckers is one of history's best-known reality shows, depicting the perilous lives of drivers in the iciest regions of Canada and Alaska. And sure, it's been criticized by actual trucker media like Truck News for exaggerating or even faking some of the danger. Man, it is cracking. It's something fierce. I can't go any slower. Oh my gosh! But real scandal hit the show in 2013. According to a CBS report, star Tim Zicker abducted Lisa Kudeau after hiring her for escort work in Las Vegas. He claimed she overcharged him by $1,000 and demanded she meet him to settle the dispute. It was then that he dragged her back to his apartment, beat her, and tied her up in a closet. Fearing for her life, Cadeau gave Zicker the phone number of an undercover police officer, claiming he could pay her ransom. Zicker called the number and unknowingly arranged his own arrest. The Las Vegas Sun reported Zicker confessed on the spot that he intended to hold Cadeau hostage and prostitute her through Craigslist. Every so often, even the History Channel has to admit that some of their programming is a tad controversial. Like the time they commissioned and then abruptly canceled a $30 million miniseries about the Kennedys. The Hollywood Reporter explained that an early leaked draft of the script caused an outcry among Kennedy family allies, and after months of rewrites and filming, the high-profile project was pulled entirely for being pretty much wall-to-wall -wall slander and lies. Either they made it sound like I like Hitler, said I was anti-American, me! Co-creator Joel Cerno defended his project via The Atlantic, claiming people were biased against him for being a staunch conservative making a series about the Kennedys. Conspiracy theorists also took the opportunity to insist that the surviving members of the Kennedy family had bullied the History Channel into dropping the show. But when the miniseries eventually did come out elsewhere, The Hollywood Reporter called it, quote, dull, unwatchable, and a ham-fisted mess. Swamp People follows the lives of alligator hunters living in Louisiana, but alligators actually seem to be the least of the cast's worries. According to TMZ, Swamp People stars R.J. Molinaire and J. Paul Molinaire were arrested for attacking a man with a beer bottle. TMZ also reported that Trapper Joe was arrested for burning his girlfriend with a lit cigarette and then punching her in the chest. And Screen Rant detailed a time that Roger Rivers Jr. got in trouble with the law for selling illegal meat. We like it all. <laughs> we eat everything down here. <laughs> the swamp people of the show proved so troublesome, Starcasm reports that most of the cast was suddenly fired before season 7 of the show, shocking fans and sending angry cast members into social media rants. Producers held firm, though, and remaining fans just had to deal with a whole new bunch of swamp people. Bigfoot Captured was a feature-length special about the discovery and capture of a real Sasquatch. It was also, as Paste Magazine put it, a TV abomination. History Channel styled the show as a real documentary, despite the fact that the program was pure fiction. But not everyone recognized it as fake, leaving some viewers furious about pseudoscience being presented as fact, and others excited to discover proof of a real Bigfoot. At this point, I think Bigfoot's going to become uh, a lot closer to reality. Not only did the channel fool their audience, they also more or less lied to their guest experts about the nature of the production. Professor Jeff Meldrum said, via the Idaho State Journal, that he was disappointed that the documentary faked evidence and had no interest in working from credible information. His suggestion for viewers? Take what you can from it and have a chuckle over the remainder. According to Variety, the show Hunting Hitler upset plenty of people by trivializing Hitler and giving credence to conspiracy theories about his escape to Argentina. If this were really a picture of Hitler, it would change history. But even more upsetting is the fact that the History Channel promised anonymity to one of their key sources, and then clearly broadcast his entire face to more than 180 countries. The team arrives at a private home where the informant, along with his translator Philippe, has arranged to meet them under the condition that his identity be protected. According to New York Daily News reports, the grandson of a Nazi war criminal agreed to appear on the program with the understanding that his face would not be shown. Production did blur his face out, except for one shot where it is clearly visible. An obvious disaster for someone who doesn't want to broadcast that his grandfather was a Nazi. Remember when the History Channel solved the mystery of Amelia Earhart only to have their key piece of evidence immediately debunked by a blogger? When you hear the name Amelia Earhart, it's a question mark that's never been solved. 
According to Vanity Fair, the documentary Amelia Earhart, The Lost Evidence caused some short-lived excitement when it presented a photo of Earhart and her navigator alive and in the Marshall Islands after her mysterious disappearance. The documentary suggests that Earhart survived her infamous crash in 1937 and that the U.S. government knew she was alive but covered it up. The network enjoyed a brief moment of historical triumph before they were thwarted by a blogger doing minimal research. National Geographic reported that Japanese military blogger Kota Yamano looked up the alleged location of the photo in the Japanese National Library's database and found that the pic was published in a Japanese coffee table book in 1935, two years before Earhart took her flight. So even if it were Amelia Earhart in that photo, which it's not, it proves nothing about her disappearance. American Pickers follows a couple of guys while they travel around the country and sift through piles of other people's junk in the hopes of finding treasure. The show's producers have occasionally been accused of planting the good stuff. While we can't know that for sure, at least one of the two stars has definitely been caught doing some less than upstanding stuff. This is a perfect situation for a pick. According to a local TV station, Frank Fritz recently pled guilty to charges of operating while intoxicated, which also included driving the wrong way on the interstate. According to the police report, Fritz was, quote, weaving about the roadway under the influence of Xanax and alcohol. The miniseries The Bible was a huge hit for the network in 2014, except for that one slip-up where the producers cast an actor who looked a whole lot like President Barack Obama to play the devil. As described in The Guardian, the comparison went viral almost immediately after the 10-hour miniseries first premiered. You couldn't throw a stone emoji without hitting several hundred posts of Obama's face next to Moroccan actor Mohamed Ozani. Producer Roma Downey claimed that the resemblance was a total coincidence, but the damage was already done. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you the whole world. Time reported that when the Bible producers cut down their series for the feature-length film version, Son of God, they decided to nix Satan entirely, hoping audiences would focus their attention on Jesus instead. The reality competition alone tries to one-up Survivor by abandoning its contestants in the middle of nowhere and then following their journey to survive alone in the wilderness. Happily, none of these people are naked, because another truly awful show already did that. Board. The really stupid thing about all of this is no matter how alone the series makes it look like these people are, of course they're not really alone. What about all the camera people, who are literally everywhere, right? One thing that's very interesting about how the show was shot is that it, it's all self-documented. We may never know the truth on that, but according to E! Celebrity, contestants are not being forced to survive miles from civilization, which is what the showrunners want you to believe. Instead, in many cases, the contestants are actually within an hour's walk of the nearest town, and sometimes they're in a place where there is a network of trails, which definitely seems to suggest that they're just not really that isolated. History's Mountain Men features people pretending like they are living in the 17th century, except for when they watch TV while no one is looking. To me, there's way too much overdevelopment in this world, and I, I want to do at least my part in keeping some of it wild. One of the stars of the show is Eustace Conway, and his deal is teaching people how to be self-sufficient and also how to be super pretentious about their self-sufficiency. His bio reads, Like Thoreau, Eustace has gone to the woods to live deliberately, fronting only the essential facts of life to see if he could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when he came to die, discover that he had not lived. Yeah, he's that kind of guy. But when he's not being pretentious on mountain men, he's being pretentious on his 1,000-acre wildlife preserve in North Carolina, where he teaches people how to live in the wilderness for a mere $700 a week, or $65 an hour if you'd rather just spend an afternoon riding around in a horse-drawn carriage. According to the Wall Street Journal, the preserve was recently raided by health, construction, and fire officials who deemed many of Conway's buildings, quote, not fit for public use. When you think of lumberjacks, you usually think of burly dudes in plaid, chopping down trees, putting wipe your butt on a spotted owl stickers on their trucks, and maybe pressing wildflowers like in that Monty Python song. You don't typically think of them pulling stuff out of the water, because that's not where trees usually are. According to NPR, though, there was a time when lumberjacks used to put felled trees on rafts and float them down the river. 
Every now and then, the trees would fall off the raft and sink to the bottom, and they don't rot down there either. If the water is cold, the trees will stay preserved at the bottom for a long time and can eventually be salvaged. The problem is, salvaging sunken trees is not legal in the state of Washington. But that didn't stop the late Axemen star Jimmy Smith from fishing those logs out of the river on national television, which was either ridiculously arrogant or ridiculously stupid. I'm the first one in the Northwest to do this type of logging. Smith had an entirely altruistic reason for his actions, though, to protect people participating in water sports on the river. He said, If I can save one kid or one boater, I think it's worth it. And we're sure that the money he got for those logs didn't factor into it at all. The Baseball Hall of Fame is meant to enshrine only the greatest players of all time. But it doesn't always work out that way. From racism to cheating to steroids, here are the Baseball Hall of Fame's biggest controversies ever. What's become known as baseball's performance-enhancing drug era, which lasted roughly from the late 1980s until the early 2000s, is a scandal that continues to reverberate throughout the sport. No one knows exactly how many players were guilty at the time of taking drugs to gain an edge, but it was undoubtedly a lot of them, and the inflated statistics of the era are clear evidence that wholesale cheating was happening. This has now infected the Hall of Fame as players widely suspected of using performance-enhancing drugs become eligible. The writers who vote on inductees aren't beholden to any clear rules or guidelines, so they can, and do, leave players off their ballots for personal reasons and many of them resent players whom they suspect of drug use. For example, Mike Piazza, one of the most dominant catchers of his time, was widely suspected of steroid use. That almost certainly explains the fact that he failed to get the required 75% of the vote the first three years he was eligible. Other notable suspected drug users who remain on the outside looking in include Barry Bonds, who holds both the single season and all-time home run records, and pitcher Roger Clemens, who won seven Cy Young Awards. The role of Commissioner of Baseball isn't what it used to be. First created in the wake of the Black Sox cheating scandal of 1919, the office was intended to rebuild confidence in the game and save the major leagues from the inter-team squabbling that threatened to tear it apart. In the modern day, the commissioner is much less independent than originally conceived, but the position is still plenty influential, which is pretty clear in the case of Bud Seeley. Seelig, who served from 1992 until 2015, was in charge during the disastrous 1994 strike that saw baseball's popularity nosedive. He also oversaw the exciting home run race between Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 1998, which is credited with re-sparking fans' love of the game and rehabilitating its image. The problem is that McGuire and Sosa were among the many players at the time who were almost certainly using performance-enhancing drugs, and Seelig didn't take the problem seriously until years later. He didn't institute a strong drug screening policy until 2005, which meant he basically allowed cheating to flourish. That's probably because it was good for business, until it wasn't. Despite all this, though, C-League was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2017. The 2020 Hall of Fame class consisted of Derek Jeter, who was voted in nearly unanimously, and Larry Walker. The latter was a good player who earned three batting titles over the course of his career. The problem is that while his statistics are impressive, they're a little on the weak side by Hall of Fame standards. Furthermore, he got a boost from playing most of his home games in Coors Field, a stadium that's notorious for boosting hitting numbers thanks to its high altitude. You know, I don't think many of us have stepped into a, a ballpark quite like that before. Prior to joining the Colorado Rockies, Walker's career batting average was 282, a perfectly respectable number, but nothing compared to the 334 he hit as a Rocky. While there are other ways of judging a player's impact, it's pretty clear that Walker benefited from a serious home field advantage. And sure, he didn't play poorly in road games, just not as spectacularly as he did at Coors. This is one reason it took Walker so long to get into the Hall. 2020, after all, was his final year of eligibility. In 2014, he received just 10.2% of the votes, largely because of the Coors field stigma. Fans continue to argue both sides of this issue, but until the Hall of Fame explains how stats like Walker's magically go from not good enough to just barely good enough, it will suffer from a credibility problem. Pete Rose has the most hits of any baseball player in Major League history, 4,256 of them to be exact. He led the league in hits seven times, and he played like a man who loved baseball more than anything. But he's not in the Hall of Fame because he bet on baseball games while he was playing for and managing the Cincinnati Reds. This earned him a permanent placement on baseball's ineligible list, which in turn means he can't make it into the Hall. 
Rose's gambling is an unforgivable sin, but there are plenty of other players in the hall who've bet on baseball games, and there are other inductees who've done way worse. While the need to punish Rose is understandable, it's been more than 30 years, and if moral failings are supposed to disqualify players from the Hall of Fame, that standard should be applied retroactively to everyone. But if that were to happen, the Hall would be a very empty place. If nothing else, though, Rose should be removed from the ineligible list so that Hall of Fame voters can decide for themselves whether or not he's deserving. The Veterans Committee, also known as the ERAS Committee, is charged with reviewing the careers of players who failed to be elected to the Hall of Fame during their initial term of eligibility. Recent years have seen changes that have shifted the focus to more modern players, but the idea is the same – give some deserving players a second chance. However, there's one problem. Prior to 2018, the Veterans Committee had never once enshrined an African American who played his entire career in the major leagues. In other words, the black players that the Veterans Committee has enshrined all played some of their time in the Negro Leagues. Some of that is due to the fact that baseball was segregated until 1947, but there have been plenty of deserving candidates whose careers began after that time. There's Dick Allen, Vita Blue, and Maury Wills, just to name a few. Recent changes to the committee structures have improved things, but even if players like Blue and Wills are eventually recognized as the greats that they were, it might be too late for them to enjoy the honor while they're still alive. The ERAS committee is designed to reconsider players who failed to make the vote during their initial years of eligibility after they've retired. This makes sense for players who have borderline statistics or other reasons that they might have been overlooked, but the committee too often elects players who obviously fall short. This was highlighted in 2018 when Harold Baines and Lee Smith were elected by the ERAS committee. While Smith arguably has the stats worthy of inclusion, as his 478 career saves rank third all-time, Baines never got more than 6.1% of the votes during his initial term of eligibility, and for good reason. He was certainly a decent player, and his total of 2,866 career hits looks pretty impressive at first glance. But his main achievement as a player was longevity. Despite frequent injuries and a lack of defensive skills, he played for 22 seasons. I, I never watched Harold Baines said he's a Hall of Famer. As John Taylor of Sports Illustrated put it, there's nothing to Baines' Hall of Fame case beyond his prodigious hit total, and he got there by piling up thousands of plate appearances as a plotting designated hitter who could barely play the field. Even Baines himself admitted to being, quote, very shocked when he was inducted. In the 1950s, the New York Yankees were a force of nature. From 1949 to 1958, they finished in first place every year, except for 1954, when they finished second. Pitcher Whitey Ford was a big reason for that success, as he racked up 236 career wins over 16 years with the Yanks, a career that got him into the Hall of Fame in 1974. The problem is that Ford admitted several times that he cheated, and pretty blatantly, too. He would cut the ball with his ring, and sometimes he would load it with mud that he purposefully seeded around the pitcher's mound. Or he'd use a special gunk he prepared ahead of time made of baby oil, turpentine, and resin. Regarding his performance in the 1963 World Series, he confessed, I used enough mud to build a dam. In a 1987 interview with the New York Times, in fact, Ford even said that he approved of pitchers cheating because the money was too good to pass up. The end result is that a player who not only admits to cheating but even endorses it has a plaque in the hall. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more revered figure in early baseball than Rogers Hornsby. His stats are legendary. He twice achieved the Triple Crown by leading the league in batting average, home runs, and RBIs. And he's the only player in baseball history to hit over 400 with 40 home runs in a single season. He later found even more success as a player-manager. But Hornsby was never well-liked by his fellow players. In fact, when he was fired as manager of the Chicago Cubs in 1932 and the team went on to the World Series without him, the players voted to deny him a share of their bonus out of spite. He was frequently fired and traded simply because he got along with precisely nobody. But worst of all, there are persistent rumors that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Longtime sports reporter Fred Lieb maintained that Hornsby had admitted as much to him, and Hornsby was also accused of releasing Catholic players from his teams because of his prejudices. The Black Sox scandal of 1919, which was dramatized in the 1988 film Eight Men Out, remains a seminal moment in baseball's history. Eight players on the Chicago White Sox were accused of taking bribes to throw the World Series. All eight were banned from baseball despite never actually being convicted of the crimes. Baseball then brought in a tough commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, to oversee the game. 
But there's one man who never suffered despite his obvious role in the scandal, White Sox owner Charles Comiskey. Comiskey was a criminally mean-spirited boss who underpaid his players and otherwise treated them pretty badly. He would humiliate them by making them launder their own uniforms, and he often cheated by benching players in order to prevent them from getting contractual bonuses. He was also a big fan of racial segregation in baseball. But despite his treatment of his own players, the Black Sox scandal, and his obvious overall negative influence on the game, he has a plaque in the Hall of Fame. The 2010s provided the sports world with some scandals we'd prefer to forget. Names like Aaron Hernandez and Oscar Pistorius went down in infamy, and they weren't the only ones who made headlines. Here are the biggest sports scandals of the 2010s. Even before the 2010s, experts had raised concerns about brain injuries suffered by professional and amateur football players. Eventually, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, became part of the sports world's active vocabulary. The issue was never as simple as football being a dangerous pursuit. One doesn't need to be a practicing physician to understand that 300-pound men repeatedly ramming their heads into each other isn't great for staying healthy. Nevertheless, the NFL denied the truth as it attempted to hide the concussion crisis hovering over the sport and the number of former players likely suffering from CTE. The league was ultimately forced to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars following a class action lawsuit filed by ex-players, although such settlements have been less than helpful for many former pros. The NFL has also taken measures to make the game safer, including in-game penalties and post-game fines for players who hit opponents high on their bodies. The league has also hired independent concussion specialists to evaluate players suspected to have suffered head injuries during games. In September 2014, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell placed Carolina Panthers defensive end Greg Hardy on the league's commissioner's exempt list after Hardy was convicted of assaulting his girlfriend. The following February, charges were dismissed after the alleged victim refused to cooperate in the criminal investigation. It was also reported that Hardy reached a financial settlement with the woman who told police he threatened her life. Nevertheless, the NFL signed Hardy to a new contract with the Dallas Cowboys. That November, Deadspin released photos of injuries that the alleged victim claimed came from Hardy's assault. Hardy's tenure with the Cowboys lasted only 12 games, and he never played again in the NFL. Not to be outdone by the Cowboys in the NFL, the UFC awarded Hardy with an opportunity to become a professional fighter in the spring of 2018. He entered November 2019 with a record of five wins, one loss, and one no contest. The biogenesis scandal was a huge story that rocked Major League Baseball throughout the 2010s. As the story goes, a man named Anthony Bosch operated a clinic that distributed performance-enhancing drugs to at least 20 players. After his operation was shut down following his arrest, he pleaded guilty and was sentenced to four years behind bars, a sentence that was ultimately reduced. The biggest name linked with Biogenesis was New York Yankees superstar slugger Alex Rodriguez, who repeatedly denied purposefully using PEDs. For the record, have you ever used steroids, human growth hormone, or any other performance-enhancing substance? No. In November 2014, however, the Miami Herald reported that Rodriguez, who spent the entire previous MLB season suspended from the game, confirmed that he purchased and used products from the Biogenesis Clinic. History suggests that Rodriguez would have been better off admitting his crimes right away, as baseball fans have repeatedly forgiven players linked with steroids and other PEDs. But considering his many denials, A-Rod might be waiting a long time for a call from the Hall of Fame once he becomes eligible in 2022. From 1981 through 2014, real estate mogul Donald Sterling served as owner of the NBA's Los Angeles Clippers. Throughout his tenure, he was accused of multiple acts of discrimination. In 2009, he agreed to pay nearly $3 million following a lawsuit over his alleged refusal to rent apartments he owned to several groups. He was also twice involved in harassment lawsuits. He settled one in 1998, and a different accuser lost her suit in 2004. But none of these incidents led to Sterling's downfall. Instead, racist comments he made that were recorded without his knowledge and published by TMZ in April 2014 resulted in Clippers players and coaches nearly boycotting a playoff game. Soon after Sterling's remarks went public, the NBA banned him for life. Effective immediately, I am banning Mr. Sterling for life. 
It was later ruled that Sterling was mentally unfit to make decisions related to his family's trust, which prevented him from blocking the sale of the Clippers. In March 2016, his lawsuit against the league and four individuals, including his wife Shelley, was dismissed. While few, if any, cried for Sterling after the matter, various commentators pointed out that his situation also brought up serious questions about privacy. For 11 months out of any given year, American sports fans couldn't have cared less about competitive cycling. But when Lance Armstrong raced in the Tour de France from 1999 to 2005, cycling was America's sport. Armstrong won the event's title all seven of those years, but accusations of wrongdoing and performance-enhancing drug use dogged him after each victory. His fans claimed that everyone was jealous that Armstrong, a cancer survivor who established what later became known as the Live Strong Foundation, was the best cyclist on the planet. They scoffed at each new allegation that emerged. But in 2012, the United States Anti-Doping Agency confirmed that Armstrong's team ran, quote, the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful doping program that sport has ever seen. The USADA also stripped Armstrong of his seven titles and banned him from the sport for life. In 2013, he admitted that he'd spent those years lying and cheating. He also bullied those who dared to suggest he wasn't clean. While speaking with Oprah Winfrey, he detailed the PED cocktail he used during his championship runs. In all seven of your Tour de France victories, did you ever take banned substances or blood dope? Yes. In 2018, Armstrong agreed to settle a lawsuit by paying nearly $7 million in damages. In the worst-case scenario, though, he could have been on the hook for $100 million, leading some to suggest he'd once again gotten away with being a fraud. In sports competitions, top-tier athletes receive what fans refer to as superstar calls from referees. No fighter in UFC history has received more superstar treatment than John Bones Jones during the 2010s. Physically speaking, Jones is the greatest fighter in UFC history. In his prime, his speed, length, agility, and strength made him an unbeatable force, other than when he defeated himself. He was his own worst enemy throughout the decade. He spent one day in rehab after he tested positive for cocaine. The UFC suspended him and stripped him of his championship in April 2015 due to his involvement in a hit-and-run case. And he's also received multiple punishments for violating the UFC's anti-drug policy. In October 2019, he pleaded no contest to disorderly conduct. There's no reason to believe that the UFC will ever care about what Jones does as long as he's eligible to brawl. The company moved an entire fight card from Las Vegas to California a week ahead of time after an atypical finding of a drug test submitted by Jones caused a licensing conflict in Las Vegas. These moves didn't come without criticism. The Wrestling Observer, among other outlets, repeatedly called out the UFC and the USADA for allowing Jones to compete with trace amounts of steroid metabolite found in his blood. On October 4, 2019, as NBA teams were embarking on a preseason tour in China, Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey tweeted the message, Fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. As many predicted at the time that tweet went public, Morey's message didn't sit well with the Chinese Basketball Association and certain Chinese officials. Morey apologized a couple of days later, which infuriated American fans who believed that he caved under the pressure of an organization that was putting profits over human rights. Lakers superstar LeBron James made matters worse for the NBA when he suggested that Morey had offered a quote, misinformed take on the China-Hong Kong matter. James' message was poorly received by many observers who saw him as a coward and a hypocrite, and as somebody willing to make bold political statements, so long as doing so didn't negatively affect his brand or the NBA. Meanwhile, some prominent figures came out in support of Maury, including Hall of Famer and TNT analyst Shaquille O'Neal. Daryl Maury was right. Whenever you see something wrong going on anywhere in the world, you should have the right to say, that's not right, and that's what he did. Metallica songs used on terrorism suspects, allegations of plagiarism, and a stadium riot after pyrotechnics go horribly wrong? The most popular metal band in the world isn't immune to controversy. These are the scandals that rocked Metallica. There's a lot of debate about exactly when Metallica went from heavy metal darling to world-renowned franchise. Many fans point to the mind-blowing sales of their self-titled album while others suggest it was the use of their song I Disappear in 2000's Mission Impossible 2. In reality, it was their fight against Napster over the legalities of P2P file sharing that brought Metallica to the forefront of international news. 
and got them labeled as sellouts by many longtime fans. According to the Washington Post, Metallica drummer Lars Ulrich and his lawyers appeared at Napster's offices in May 2000 with the names of over 335,000 individuals who had used the service to download the band's music. Napster settled the landmark dispute with the group in 2001, but the scandal has hung like a black cloud over Metallica ever since. In a 2013 interview with HuffPost, Ulrich acknowledged that the Napster debacle was the biggest incident that the band has become notorious for. He elaborated, It'll be in the first five sentences of my obituary, and I sort of accept that for better or worse. Ulrich went on to assert that he had no regrets over the situation, despite being parodied by the likes of Weird Al Yankovic and South Park. We're gonna sit here and protest with you until free downloading stops, yeah! Dave Mustaine is an absolute beast on the guitar, known for his iconic riffs in songs like Holy Wars, The Punishment Due, and Symphony of Destruction. He's so talented, in fact, that he was awarded the number one spot in music journalist Joel McIver's book, The 100 Greatest Metal Guitarists in 2008. The accolade meant a lot to Mustaine, who revealed to Classic Rock that he was particularly happy to finish above both of his former Metallica bandmates, James Hetfield and Kirk Hammett. While Mustaine claims to be on better terms with the members of Metallica nowadays, he's still known to fire off the occasional potshot. Mustaine's firing from the band on April 11, 1983 is still a sore point of contention for both him and his fans. Reportedly, Metallica found Mustaine's alcohol abuse to be too extreme and parted ways with him in an abrupt manner. The band packed his bags, woke him up, and gave him a one-way bus ticket out of town. It also didn't help matters much that Metallica had already lined up Hammett as his replacement 10 days earlier. After his bitter departure, Mustaine went on to form the successful thrash outfit Megadeth, which stands alongside Metallica as one of the big four American thrash metal bands. There's nothing quite as disappointing as trying to find tickets for a show and seeing they're all sold out. What's even worse is discovering a scalper pushing for ridiculous prices because they know there's a desperate audience. This is James from Metallica. Survey says, you need cash. Many artists agree with fans that ticket scalping can do serious harm to the music and live entertainment industries. Unfortunately, Metallica didn't seem to think so. A 2019 report from Billboard revealed that they were actually getting in on the action alongside several other musical acts. The scandalous discovery found that Live Nation allowed artists to sell tickets on scalping sites for larger profit margins. A recorded phone call featured Tony DeChaiko, an associate of Metallica's, asking Live Nation's Bob Rue for help selling 88,000 Metallica tickets on scalping sites. It wasn't a good look for anyone involved, but the band members themselves claimed that they were unaware any of it was taking place. Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, but when music is concerned, it could be grounds for a lengthy lawsuit. In the case of Metallica, they received some serious bad press in 2016 because of a letter their lawyer sent to another band, a cover band to be precise. The Canadian band called Sandman, clearly named after Metallica's song Enter Sandman, received a cease and desist letter from Metallica's attorney, demanding they stop using anything related to the name of Metallica in their personal branding as a group. Vocalist Joe D. Toronto posted the letter on Facebook, where it received a lot of attention from both fans and the music community. Eventually, the incident came to the attention of the band itself, which gave a statement to Rolling Stone saying, Sandman should file the letter in the trash. Keep doing what you're doing. We totally support you. Metallica also hinted in their statement that the lawyer who'd sent the letter in question had since been fired. On August 8, 1992, Metallica and Guns N' Roses were deep into their co-headlining tour. There had been a few hiccups along the way, including Axl Rose's constant lateness. On this fateful evening on Montreal's Olympic Stadium, Metallica played first, but their set ended much sooner than anticipated. During a performance of Fade to Black, Hetfield accidentally found himself trapped in a shower of pyrotechnics, causing second and third degree burns on his arm that required immediate medical attention. The back of the hand is where it was, was the worst. And right here is okay, is where my wristband was, so <laughs> I'm all right here. <laughs> Instead of Guns N' Roses doing Metallica and the audience a solid by playing a longer set, the band showed up late on stage, and Rose cut short his band's performance after less than an hour due to alleged voice issues. This apparently incensed the audience, per the New York Times, 
as many of the 53,000 fans rioted and rampaged, causing significant damage to the venue. Needless to say, this isn't a moment that's fondly remembered in either band's careers. Metallica has never been afraid to cite their influences. Their album, consisting entirely of cover songs called Garage Inc., is solid proof. The band proudly salutes those who have had a helping hand in shaping their sound, with inspirations ranging from Black Sabbath to Queen. However, there was one incident in the early 90s where a Californian thrash band called Excel noticed that the hook in Enter Sandman sounded eerily similar to the one in their 1989 track Tapping Into the Emotional Void. Excel decided to not drag the matter in front of the courts at the time, though. Excel's manager Jane Hoffman told the LA Times, A lawsuit unfortunately sucks everything else out of your life. Every day you're dealing with it. Instead of dealing with positives, you're dealing with negatives, and nothing is proceeding. Metallica's co-manager Cliff Bernstein admitted that he was aware of Excel as a musical outfit, but claimed that he never heard the song in question. The 1986 passing of Metallica's original bassist Cliff Burton in a tragic bus accident devastated the other members of the band. While Burton has never been forgotten by his bandmates, the show had to go on, and a replacement was sorely needed. Metallica auditioned over 40 bassists before settling on Jason Newstead. Newstead's run with the band was a solid one, as he served as part of the fearsome quartet for 15 years before finally departing in 2001. Newstead left Metallica after feeling frustrated over his lack of creative input, and also to recover from neck and back injuries he'd sustained. Lars Ulrich admitted in an interview with Apple Music that Metallica didn't handle his exit well, saying, Jason is the only member of Metallica who has ever left willingly, and that in itself is a statistic. And the resentment from James and I was just so, you can't do that. You can only leave if we want you to leave. And then we weren't equipped at the time to do a deep dive into why he was leaving. While there was animosity between the parties for quite a while, it was all resolved by the time Metallica, Newstead included, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Newstead told Rolling Stone about receiving the call about the induction. I talked to Lars and it's all good. I was happy to hear from him. I hadn't talked to him for a long time, so it was nice to hear his voice. It can be tough being a musician. No artist walks into the studio with the intention of creating a mediocre single or album but they'll often suffer the wrath of critics and fans if they don't deliver what was expected of them. Some will take criticism in stride, while others tend to get vocal about their detractors. Whichever way they go, most artists typically don't do what Metallica did during the run-up to their album Death Magnetic. In 2008, Metallica invited a few journalists to an early listening session of the album in London, England. The journalists were not asked to sign non-disclosure agreements, so a few writers presumed it was fair game and published their thoughts on the album afterwards. Not too long after the reviews appeared online, Metallica's team asked for the publications to take them down, claiming what they'd heard was an early mix of the album and not the final product. I bought this when it came out. I was horrified when I listened to it. I threw it off a bridge and watched a truck smash it. There's no shortage of songs that music fans consider the worst ever. Some might even be so bad that listening to them feels like pure torture. And it turns out that's exactly what the military did when it wanted to break down prisoners during the War on Terror, as it pumped up the volume and let the music do the job. While some of us might have expected something truly grating like Crazy Frog or Tiny Tim to be blaring over the speakers, it was often Metallica's Enter Sandman being blasted at Guantanamo Bay and another detention camp at the border of Iraq and Syria. After being informed that his band's music was the torture device of choice, Hatfield joked, We've been punishing our parents, our wives, our loved ones with this music forever. Why should the Iraqis be any different? However, it does seem like Metallica wasn't too ecstatic with all the publicity the situation brought them. Navy SEAL Robert O'Neill told Esquire that the band specifically requested for the military to stop using their music in this way. After St. Anger failed to capture the critics' thumbs up and the fans' cash, Metallica took some time out to plan their next effort, five years to be exact. Without a shadow of a doubt, 2008's Death Magnetic was better received than its predecessor. But that didn't stop around 16,000 fans from signing a petition to demand that the album be remixed because of a perceived poor sound quality. In an interview with Blender, Lars Ulrich addressed the criticisms of the album's sound, explaining, there's nothing up with the audio quality. It's 2008 and that's how we make records. 
producer Rick Rubin's whole thing is to try and get it to sound lively, to get it to sound loud, to get it to sound exciting, to get it to jump out at the speakers. The internet gives everybody a voice, and the internet has a tendency to give the complainers a louder voice. Despite the initial complaints, Death Magnetic was certified double platinum in 2010, having sold over 2 million copies. How do you do it, man? Mm, I play, man. I play. How do you make a metalhead angry? Just cut their hair. While it might sound like a cheesy joke, ask Metallica and they'll tell you it's true. Despite the Black Album sitting as the number one album on the Billboard 200 for four weeks straight, a new genre climbed out of the gutters of Seattle and exploded onto the music scene in the early 90s. Grunge music brought with it a new sound and aesthetic. Gone were the long hair and sleeveless band shirts of the past, making way for musicians who often had shorter hairstyles and an unhealthy obsession with plaid. In the lead-up to 1996's Load, Metallica underwent a grunge-approved makeover. When they reappeared in the public eye, the group looked more like Sugar Ray than Slayer. Kirk Hammett told Deseret News, We didn't think it was that big of a deal, and it really surprised us that everyone else made such a fuss. But it's cool because we like controversy. The band's style continued to evolve over the years, but nothing was ever quite as drastic or controversial as the infamous look from the 90s. There's something deeply wrong with the way Fox News skews reality to suit its agenda. The news part of Fox News is suspect, and the sheer level of toxic scandals the network has been plagued by for the past few decades attests to that. Here are some of the biggest scandals to hit Fox News. Bias is human. However, journalistic standards demand a certain level of objectivity regarding facts. If you're a news anchor, your opinion on any politician and or organization must take a back seat to the objective reality regarding whether they are corrupt, authoritarian, or just plain sleazy. Fox News generally doesn't play by those rules. Instead, the network chooses its conclusion and either cherry-picks information or outright lies to get there creating a conservative echo chamber that has deepened polarization across the U.S., as explained by The Guardian. Over the years, Fox's irresponsible promotion of inaccuracies and constant pro-GOP flag-waving have fueled many baseless theories and misconceptions, while making the network itself increasingly powerful. As David Frum, former speechwriter for George W. Bush, once said, Republicans originally thought that Fox worked for us, and now we're discovering we work for Fox. This problem has worsened in recent years, as seen by the relationship that President Trump has with the daytime show Fox and Friends. Regardless of what anyone thinks about Trump or Fox, the fact is that it's unprofessional how Fox and Friends works tirelessly to rewrite factual narratives to better suit the president's needs, knowing that he's watching, and purposefully giving him talking points to try to deflect current scandals, as The New Yorker assessed. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. President. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Politics aside, the toxic culture inside Fox News headquarters, particularly in regard to the treatment of women, is well documented. And as is so often the case, the problem started at the top. Roger Ailes, the now deceased CEO, had numerous harassment allegations against him from women at the network, according to Vox. This misconduct continued unabated for years, but eventually boiled over into both a federal investigation and Ailes himself being removed from the network he founded, according to the Los Angeles Times. These events were later adapted into the 2019 film Bombshell. Ask yourself what would scare my grandmother or piss off my grandfather, and that's a Fox story. Then there's Bill O'Reilly, whose own history of harassment involving a $32 million settlement wasn't enough to get Fox News to can him, until the whole thing became so publicized that advertisers were pulling out left and right. By the way, this wasn't the first scandal involving O'Reilly. Some years prior, during O'Reilly's tense custody trial with his ex-wife, Gawker reported that O'Reilly's teenage daughter said she had witnessed her father choking her mother and that he had, quote, dragged her down the stairs by her neck. Fox News has a long, long history of racism, both on screen and off, and has racked up a long, long list of legal cases to prove it. One example? In 2017, The New York Times reported that 11 Fox News employees were suing the network for racial discrimination. Company comptroller Judith Slater was alleged to have mocked the way that black employees pronounced words. And following Trump's controversial travel ban, evidently asked them, Who is going to Africa? 
On screen, of course, Fox's history of racism is a matter of public record. In 2019, Free Press called out Tucker Carlson for wrongfully claiming, there aren't that many hate crimes occurring in the country. This was a blatant lie, considering hate crimes have actually been on the rise, according to the FBI. In 2020, the Anti-Defamation League wrote an open letter to Fox News demanding that the network stop using anti-Semitic stereotypes. After repeated instances of the network stirring up anti-Jewish resentment in its coverage against Bernie Sanders, Michael Bloomberg, and George Soros. Meanwhile, Fox has continually defended police brutality against people of color, gaslighted viewers regarding slavery and Jim Crow laws, and planted numerous false allegations and stereotypes against Latinx Americans, immigrants, Asian Americans, the indigenous community, LGBTQ plus individuals, and more. Climate change is real as are the dangers posed by COVID-19. Fox News, though, has violently contradicted the science regarding both of these realities, with deadly results. Because of climate change. That's how so the world much of this you don't know, for humans. you pretend that you know, but you don't know. As far as climate change, there's a 97% consensus among scientists regarding humankind's role in the climate horrors being wrought. Nonetheless, as The Guardian points out, Fox News has gone out of its way to disproportionately interview skeptical experts on screen, or to give airtime to non-experts bankrolled by fossil fuel corporations. In 2019, Public Citizen tracked that 87% of Fox News' climate coverage was devoted to climate denialism, putting out long-debunked conspiracy theories even as literal catastrophes ravaged the globe. The same is true of COVID-19. In early 2020, The Guardian reported that Fox News aggressively downplayed the threat posed by the novel coronavirus, putting out misleading and or false information, comparing it to a bad cold, and other lies which likely played a huge role in the U.S.'s largely failed response to the pandemic. In fact, a University of Chicago study cited by NPR looked at Fox News viewers and found a direct link between those who watched Sean Hannity's program, which went out of its way to downplay the threat, and increased COVID-19 cases. By April 2020, Fox News' efforts to label COVID-19 a hoax resulted in a lawsuit, according to Forbes. Back in 2013, a religious scholar named Reza Aslan wrote a book titled Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth, an account of what factors might have shaped the historical Jesus Christ. To promote the book, Aslan did an interview on Fox News, where host Lauren Green interrogated Aslan with startlingly ignorant questions like, you're a Muslim, so why did you write a book about the founder of Christianity? She even accused him of hiding his Islamic background. Aslan responded, repeatedly, that he wrote a book as an academic who had built his career studying religions, and who just happens to be Muslim. It still begs the question, why would you be interested in the founder of Christianity? Because it's my job as an academic. I am a professor of religion. Not surprisingly, this debacle was pronounced by BuzzFeed as, quote, the most embarrassing interview Fox News has ever done. But it did help promote Oslin's book. Behind the scenes, Fox News hosts plenty of weird soap operas. One particularly messy spat went public in 2010 when Fox chairman Rupert Murdoch's son-in-law, Matthew Freud, told the New York Times that he was ashamed of being connected to his father-in-law's news network, stating, I am by no means alone within the family or the company in being ashamed and sickened by Roger Ailes' horrendous and sustained disregard of the journalistic standards that News Corporation, its founder, and every other global media business aspires to. Ouch. Following this pointed statement, Elizabeth, Murdoch's daughter, told The Guardian that her husband had gone rogue with his comment, but it's worth noting that, surprisingly enough, Elizabeth was also a Barack Obama supporter. Murdoch's company, for its part, issued a cold statement saying Freud's views had nothing to do with Murdoch's. This wouldn't be the end of the Fox family drama, however. In 2019, the mogul's own son, James Murdoch, told Vanity Fair that he thought his father's network was destroying what he called the connective tissue of society and expressed interest in funding his own liberal media outlet to compete with Fox. For the record, James donated to the Pete Buttigieg presidential campaign. Arguably, one of the worst impacts that Fox News has on society is the network's continual mainstreaming of fringe conspiracy theories. There was birtherism, the bizarre and racist argument that Barack Obama was born outside of the United States, a theory that probably never would have gained anywhere near as much traction if it hadn't been broadly publicized by Fox News, according to Media Matters. Then there's the Seth Rich nonsense. 
explained by Vox, wherein the tragic shooting of a young Democratic National Committee staffer led Fox News to make baseless accusations blaming the Clintons. Fox News also advanced Sarah Palin's claim that the Affordable Care Act would result in, quote, death panels, even while other conservatives were referring to her comments as irresponsible and crazy. More recently, Fox devoted a staggering amount of airtime to Obamagate, a conspiracy theory so muddled that even ardent followers can't coherently describe what it is, but which mainly functioned as a convenient pivot from Fox's handling of COVID-19. According to an archived TV Newser article, Fox News bought full-page advertisements in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Post, with a photograph from a Tea Party protest that had taken place several days earlier on September 12, 2009. This advertisement, displaying a large crowd protesting big government, was headlined by the caption, How did ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, and CNN miss this story? To be clear, yes, the 912 protest happened. Fox didn't make it up. What they did lie about was their claim that other networks didn't cover it, since all of them did exactly that. So what Fox News was doing here, with a clear bias toward the Tea Party, was deceiving their base in order to create an us-or-them narrative. By falsely claiming a huge and important event had happened and major networks had tried to brush it under the radar. Naturally, the news networks in question quickly clarified that Fox was lying. Leaked email stories are perhaps the most common recurring scandal type of the 21st century, and Fox News had its own email gate back in 2010, according to Media Matters, when private messages from the network's managing editor and VP Bill Salmon were made public, revealing just how intentionally Salmon wanted to slant the news. To summarize, the emails showed that Salmon was aggressively ordering the staff to take a hard right on the issue of healthcare reform through subversive tactics, such as referring to the public option as a government option, to play into the Tea Party resentment and scare people away from it. The propaganda didn't stop there. Other emails, as reported by the Benton Institute, showed Salmon was trying to damage then-Senator Barack Obama by highlighting a past relationship with a white woman, basically to inflame racist viewers and to equate Obama's political views with Marxism. Salmon's emails also showed him urging staffers to employ climate change denialism, according to Politico, arguing that climate science had been called into question and saying, It is not our place as journalists to assert such notions as facts, especially as this debate intensifies. Despite this scandal, Salmon is still with the network. Sean Hannity is another Fox News celebrity who is seemingly always involved in scandals, whether due to outright deceptions or his publicly advising a president with whom he has private dinners. 2018, though, was a particularly bad year for Hannity, largely thanks to his questionable choice of lawyer. As the New York Times reported, it was in a Manhattan courtroom where the world learned that Hannity was a client of the now infamous Trump lawyer Michael Cohen, a fact which Hannity desperately tried to deny arguing he'd never paid Cohen for his services. It might be difficult to convince people that you're providing unbiased commentary on impeachment scandals when you share a lawyer with the president. I've said many times, if he cured cancer, they would likely want to impeach him for curing cancer. The incident led The Guardian to unearth a mountain of public records showing that Hannity possessed a secret real estate empire, with a Fox News host linked to a number of shell companies owning over 870 homes in seven states, ranging from mansions to low-income housing. Many of these properties were purchased at a low rate in 2013 because banks had foreclosed on their previous owners for mortgage defaults. This is ironic, since his show had, at the time, been slamming the Obama administration for allowing so many homes to foreclose while Hannity himself had been buying said homes up with shell companies and getting legal advice from Michael Cohen. Was Madonna calling Drake on his hotline bling to apologize for an unwanted kiss? Who thought a holographic Tupac was a good idea? Kanye West? These are Coachella's biggest controversies. It may not surprise you to learn that Coachella has often been the setting for the latest episode of celebrities behaving badly. And in 2015, that particular show's featured guest was Justin Bieber. While Bieber was putting quite a bit of distance between himself and his former squeaky clean image, he still wasn't exactly the type of guy you'd think would get dragged out of a major music festival by his head after trying to access a very restricted area. You wouldn't have thought that, yet here we are. According to The Guardian, Bieber ran afoul of security when he attempted to enter an artist's only area, despite the fact that he was not performing that year to get a better view of Drake's set. Bieber insisted that he was only there at Drake's invitation. Security insisted that they didn't care. 
and after some unpleasantries were exchanged, Bieber was dragged out in a headlock. The incident did absolutely nothing to help the singer's swiftly faltering public image, but it did help him to miss Drake's set. Speaking of Drake's set, it had its own set of problems. It all started when Drake named one of his songs after musical icon Madonna on his 2015 mixtape, If You're Reading This, It's Too Late. After breaking out the song at Coachella, the rapper shocked the audience by inviting Madonna herself up on stage, where she got down with her own 1994 song, Human Nature. At the song's conclusion, Madonna seized a seated Drake from behind, tilted his head back, and planted a kiss on him. And it was no friendly little peck. Madonna, 28 years Drake senior, went all the way in. Drake would later take to Instagram to assuage fans of the notion that he had been less than thrilled with the sexy ambush, saying, Don't misinterpret my shock. I got to make out with the Queen Madonna, and I feel 100 about that forever. Still, despite Drake's protests, it was perhaps the most awkward thing to ever happen on a Coachella stage. Perhaps we spoke too soon. At the 2012 festival, fans were psyched to learn that they would be treated to an appearance by legendary rapper Tupac who had not performed publicly in 16 years. This is because, in case you missed it, Tupac had been quite dead for 16 years at the time. Nevertheless, headliners Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg called Pac in for an assist on a couple of iconic tunes. Via Hologram, one of the first uses of the technology for the questionable purpose of raising deceased entertainers from the dead. In the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. After the set, which was received with an odd mixture of elation and extreme confusion, Dre and Snoop raised the possibility of hauling Pac's hologram out on the road for a tour, a development which thankfully failed to materialize. But the performance certainly got people talking, and that discussion was a bit of a mixed bag, to say the least. As reported by the New Zealand Herald, pop star Katy Perry stated that she cried when she saw old Pac's ghostly image. Quest's love of the roots, meanwhile, bluntly said that the hologram haunted him in his sleep. Sly Stone is a funky legend that is not up for debate. Albums like 1971's seminal There's a Riot Going On and culture permeating singles like Everyday People and Dance to the Music made him a household name in the 60s and 70s. Unfortunately, he fell on hard times in later years, a situation in which his former manager Jerry Goldstein played a part. That's the tale Sly told the crowd at Coachella in 2010. Unfortunately, they had been expecting a little more music and a little less angry ranting. According to LA Weekly, Sly turned in a set that was a sad spectacle, during which he would only sing a few bars of his classic hits at a time before pausing to wonder aloud how long he had to remain on stage to get paid, and also to go on at length about his financial troubles, which, in his estimation, were pretty much solely due to Goldstein. So angry and specific was his rant that Goldstein ended up suing him for libel over it, which turned out not to be a very good idea. Sly promptly filed a countersuit, and in 2015, a civil injury found that Stone was actually right. As reported by CNN, Goldstein, along with Sly's former attorney Glenn Stone, were ordered to pay $5 million in damages. Since its first show, Coachella has only missed three years. There was no event in 2000, the year after the inaugural festival. And the shindig was canceled in 2020 and 2021 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This may have been a weird kind of blessing in disguise for the festival in 2020, as the lineup that was announced that year was poised for a not insignificant amount of blowback. That year, attention was being called to the fact that Coachella had only ever had four female headliners up to that point, and the 2020 lineup put a big, glaring spotlight on the issue. It wasn't just that all three headliners, Rage Against the Machine, Travis Scott, and Frank Ocean were a bunch of dudes. It was more the fact that sitting below those dudes, aced out of headliner status, was Lana Del Rey, whose 2019 album received widespread critical adulation and won an Album of the Year Grammy. Ocean, meanwhile, hadn't released an album in four years, and it had been ever so slightly longer than that for Rage, who literally have not released new music in two decades. The Twitterverse took notice, taking to the platform to blast the organizers for this, and for the fact that several LGBTQ icons, such as Carly Rae Jepsen and Charlie XCX, were shoved way down underwater in the billing. And then COVID-19 hit. The festival was postponed and eventually scrapped. And at least for a while, everyone forgot about it. 
Well, what do we do with that information? What do you do with any information? You just stuff it deep down inside and keep an eye you on it. You keep it. In November 2021, a horrible tragedy was in the news. At the Astro World Festival in Houston, 10 people died and dozens were seriously injured when an enormous, spontaneous crowd push occurred during a performance by festival founder Travis Scott, who was apparently oblivious to the horror unfolding just a few yards away from him. Scott endured intense public blowback after the incident, up to and including the online circulation of a petition to remove Scott from the lineup at the next festival on his schedule. Guess which? After a short bout of hemming and hawing, Golden Voice announced that Scott was indeed being booted from Coachella 2022, with CEO Paul Tullett issuing a public statement that Scott displayed gross negligence and sheer lack of compassion for human life. That said, Scott ended up performing at a Coachella after party, so perhaps Tullett's public statement wasn't exactly heartfelt. Coachella 2022 may have washed its hands of Travis Scott, but thanks to Kanye West, Scott wasn't done getting all tangled up in controversy surrounding the festival. West, originally set to headline along with Harry Styles and Billie Eilish, loudly called attention to himself after footage surfaced online of Eilish during a recent concert, announcing to the crowd that someone in the audience was having trouble and she would have to wait to make sure they were okay before continuing. West, of course, took this not as an admirable display of responsibility, but as a direct insult to his buddy Scott, whom he had planned to invite on stage during his set. Naturally, Kanye took to Instagram to demand an apology from Eilish in all caps, threatening to pull out of the festival if she failed to do so. After yet another online petition calling for his removal started to snowball, West apparently saw the writing on the wall. He went ahead and yanked himself from the lineup two weeks before the festival's commencement, prompting the ever-ready The Weeknd to step in as his replacement. In 2014, the New York Daily News ran a story that was picked up by several major outlets simply because it just sounded too plausible. In it, it was alleged that various non-musical celebrities were seeking and sometimes receiving big, fat paydays simply for attending Coachella and promoting the festival on social media. Didn't you and your wife, did you meet on a roll, on something like that or? Pretty much, yeah. No, we, we met at Coachella. Um, oh. uh, <laughs> Now, it wasn't reported that Golden Voice was handing out the checks. Leah Michelle, for example, is alleged to have pulled down $20,000 to wear the clothing brand Lacoste to the event. Vanessa Hudgens, as reported by Spin, is said to have been paid $15,000 by McDonald's. Of course, no celebrity ever actually came forward to confirm that they had made big money just for showing up to an event that your average fan must pay hundreds of dollars to attend. But that's not terribly surprising. For years, some high-profile festival attendees have taken a bit of flack over some of the fashions, hairstyles, and accessories they choose to wear to Coachella. Celebs like Kylie Jenner, Vanessa Hutchins, and Alessandra Ambrosio have been accused of blatant cultural appropriation for wearing such festive accessories as Native American-style feathered headdresses and South Asian bindis, as well as hairstyles like cornrows and braids. This issue has dogged the festival for quite some time. It's gotten to the point that many outlets are now running articles advising people how not to get all culturally appropriative at the festival. Look, it should go without saying, but here it is anyway. Don't swipe other culture's stuff as if it were your own. Also, while we're offering advice to Coachella and its attendees, don't raise rappers from the dead, kiss Drake when he's not expecting it, or be Kanye West. <laughs>